Kalimera. I'm delighted to back to Technical University of Crete. I lectured here uh, just last year or so. I was highly also impressed meeting with Rector Magellus Abakovi and his vision and he also had a uh, he visited us last year during the summer school. We had a wonderful discussion about the future of the healthcare and the environmental engineering and in general fusion of engineering into healthcare. And also the vice sector, <coughs> he has been fantastic help for us for many years. And we decided to have the second day of the institute on the campus to meet with the leadership of the university and also colleagues and who has been doing a fantastic job because I tremendously enjoyed the visiting the laboratories at the department at the university. The purpose of the institute is indeed really to discuss the emerging technologies, especially in the areas of brain science, brain initiative, data science, and micro nanotechnologies in medicine and biology. It's not really a conference, it's not a science school. <coughs> the idea was behind early 2009, just to have 30 uh, well-established scientists, 10 rising stars is a closed door meeting for the people to talk about the future of the science and technologies and impact on the society and prepare a report, a non-binding report or white paper to be called in the United States to science advisor of the President of the United States as well as NIH, NSF directors and other colleagues, Chinese Academy of Science and EU just to uh, unwind them again uh, the suggestions and recommendations uh, that was the purpose. So I'm coming here, it was very important because this is a technical university. I also am an engineer. I firmly believe that is engineering innovations will really move the medicine as they did for the biology into the next level. Any doctor's office we can go right now, at least more or less everything around were envisioned, implemented and designed by engineers. It could be biomedical, chemical, mechanical engineer. I also believe that we will continue really uh, moving the medicine into the next level with the engine innovation, not macro scale, maybe more nano and micro scales with inventions and contributions. So the engineers, we are innovators, I think we also continue to revolutionize the medicine for the next generation. We have several distinguished colleagues to talk today and the, I don't want to continue talking and I would like to, it's a great pleasure and honor to invite our rector to join us and the, Thank you so much for hosting us. Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the Technical University of Crete. It's a very summery day here. We had a very long uh, weekend, and now we have the, the summer. Maybe most of you would prefer to be at the beach right now. Um, but uh, this is very interesting for us to have you uh, here. We are, in Greece we have 24 universities. We are the third smallest one. But we have the, the great advantage over most of the other universities because we're just engineering. We have four schools or departments and there are about 120 uh, professors. We're a very dynamic school, despite the fact that we're very small, we are one of the best known universities uh, in Greece and, and in Europe, and all of, the, all of my colleagues uh, are putting a lot of effort to, to do uh, excellent work here. Now, I would like to thank our very good friend, Metin, for setting up this, this event, but also because he has been promoting Crete and the summer school, and we hope that we have a more uh, permanent cooperation. All of you are always welcome here. And we hope that this, work, uh, that this workshop today will give us the opportunity to extend our friendship to all of you and have a fruitful cooperation uh, in the future. Thank you very much again. And, and uh, I'm very confident that we're going to hear extremely interesting uh, presentations. And uh, we have an opportunity during the breaks also to have individual talks and know each other a little bit better. Thank you.
I am Michalis Zermakis, uh, and uh, I am delighted to have all of you here. I want to, to extend a special thanks to Professor <coughs> Nakai uh, and Professor Yasmin Nakai for the constant uh, support of uh, uh, our activities and our university. Uh, I am tempted uh, just for a moment to show you uh, uh, a little bit the campus over here. So uh, please allow me to uh, use this one. Uh, this is the campus of the Technical University of Crete. Uh, uh, as uh, the rector said, uh, we are a small university, but in a very nice place, and uh, uh, we strive to achieve uh, the excellence in, uh, uh, in uh, all the aspects of uh, engineering. Uh, <coughs> In biomedical engineering, there is a lot of activity all over the campus, but <coughs> I just want to give you an idea, a brief idea of the activities in the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, so that we can start also some discussions after the very interesting <coughs> talks uh, from your side. Uh, the uh, uh, laboratory of Electronics, headed by Professor Ballas, has uh, established uh, a very, very uh, extensive activity on optical biopsy, not only on the electronics aspects, but also on the interaction of tissue with uh, contrast uh, agents and light. And uh, all this activity, and please uh, allow me to go uh, briefly through uh, these uh, activities and the uh, transparencies and all of these will be available. And I hope we have the chance to discuss uh, during the break, uh, breaks uh, much uh, uh, longer on that. Uh, this activity has uh, resulted in uh, two spin-off companies. One is uh, Dysis Medical, uh, dealing with spectral imaging for non-invasive diagnosis of uh, cervical neoplasia, uh, using essentially uh, the, 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 the uh, optoelectronic system that has been developed by Professor Ballas. And the second one is uh, the Q-cell, which uh, comes to the miniaturization of uh, the hyperspectral camera, and the uses are uh, both, both for the uh, melanoma uh, diagnosis and uh, another one uh, in uh, the papillary reflex measurements uh, where the assumption behind that is that uh, the eye is a window to the brain. We'll uh, hear a lot about brain research but also uh, the phenotype or the activities of uh, the, the body relate to the brain. Now, in uh, the Display Digital Image Signal Processing Laboratory, we have activities on uh, uh, el electrophysiological signal analysis coming from, uh, from uh, the, the, the analysis on time, time frequency, uh, the localization on brain topographies, and essentially the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, eventual uh, aspect is the synchronization of the components of EEG. Then we have a lot of uh, applications in bioinformatics and I would like to, to, to thank my uh, good colleagues where we have a good collaboration, Professor Fotiadis and Professor Kafajopoulos. Uh, in bioinformatics one of the applications is uh, network analysis, and uh, this is an example of how it progresses uh, uh, in oral cancer, and uh, another one in, uh, uh, in circulating uh, tumor cells, where the, the uh, uh, results that we have uh, indicate uh, specific genes are, are precursors of uh, metastasis. Then, uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, extensive work on tumor uh, evolution and uh, uh, the effects of different aspects like uh, the influence of oxygen and glucose, uh, nutrients and metabolic weights, uh, and uh, eventually uh, a glycolytic model on uh, the uh, evolution of tumors. Then the Intelligence Laboratory with uh, Professor Petraitis, Professor Mania, Professor Lagoudakis, Professor Harkiadakis has developed a lot of applications on, on re uh, remote health monitoring uh, via uh, devices that can be transferred to uh, transfer information to cloud. 
one of these applications uh, uh, relate to, uh, to the, the, the monitoring of hospitalized patients uh, by monitoring the motion of uh, the head. <coughs> Another one uh, is a rehabilitation scenario where uh, the sensors uh, watch out the exercises performed by uh, the, 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 uh, the person that is being monitored. And another one is the remote uh, interaction between a robot and uh, the uh, human through motion sensors. Uh, the software uh, laboratory, which is headed by Professor Minos Verofalakis, but also uh, <coughs> uh, Professor Delianakis, who is with us, is uh, a good member. Uh, I would like to say that Professor Minos Verofalakis was uh, yesterday uh, awarded uh, the fellowship of ACM, so he could not be with us. Uh, and uh, the uh, relations with uh, the biomedical is in, through the Human Brain Project, data analytics for medical and genetics data, and also privacy and security issues. Uh, last but not least, I would like to mention uh, about our efforts to establish a biomedical engineering master's program. And this is a joint effort uh, among the Technical University of Crete, the University of Crete, and the Foundation of Research and Technology, HELAS IV. Uh, essentially, uh, the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering from here participates in this effort, along with uh, the School of Medicine and the Department of Computer Science and Material Science which is from the University of Crete, and also the Foundation of uh, uh, Research and Technology, HELAS IV, uh, through different uh, departments, and I am delighted that we have uh, uh, colleagues, uh, representatives from uh, from Ford, and thank you for coming. The students uh, will be on the fields of engineering, medicine and sciences and uh, we target for uh, a lot of international participation. Uh, we have uh, planned uh, the duration in five trimesters uh, and uh, indicative uh, uh, plan would be the first trimester to have uh, an introductory uh, module on uh, uh, cell biology and software uh, analysis. The second one dedicated to biofabrication, molecular diagnostics and therapy. The third one on uh, biomedical imaging. Uh, where's the fourth one going to, towards uh, the medical information systems? And the fifth one uh, uh, relates to the medical product and business development, which I find it uh, quite uh, interesting in going from uh, the ideas, from the research into uh, complete uh, products. Uh, and uh, in uh, the uh, execution and the evolution of this program, which is planned to, uh, to start uh, uh, next, uh, uh, by uh, 2021, uh, I think there is a lot of room for collaboration. Uh, we strive to, uh, to have you involved and uh, we'd be delighted uh, to, to have you involved in this effort. Uh, we'll uh, uh, discuss uh, more about uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, let's say, master program, but uh, uh, you know, our intention is to be as uh, uh, international as possible. And uh, uh, this uh, panel of uh, experts that we have over here is a unique opportunity to, uh, let's say, to uh, strive for collaborations and uh, I get uh, the experiences uh, from you uh, in our uh, endeavor. So uh, essentially we have the chance to uh, discuss more about that after uh, your exciting presentations. And uh, once more, I would like to thank you for being here and uh, giving us uh, and our students the opportunity to learn from the experts, from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the first-hand uh, expertise, and uh, also to initiate the discussions. Welcome again, I hope you have a good time, and thank you very much, a deep thank from, for coming here and uh, hosting this event. Thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Brother Eddie Grover.
Frederick was the first founding director of NIBID in Washington. As you know, NIH has several institutes. In our time, it's a well-known NCI, National Cancer Institute, and also aging. But this was a new institute initiated, and Frederick Roderick was selected as the first founding director of this. During his tenure, he really started several programs, not only research, but also educational programs, and he did tremendous changes in the structure. And I think the budget was almost close to about $1 billion for the uh, NIBIB. Uh, then he is right now currently executive dean of New Medical School in Houston, which is more engineering oriented <coughs> medical school. And this is the second one in the United States, or the first one, with Urbana Champaign uh, University of Illinois. They also start similar programs because, as you know, in the United States, uh, you go to medical school after you get a college degree. So I'm a department chair. Our best students, like 10, 15 percent of them, they go to medical school at the first year. So the uh, it's also <coughs> in my view it's a good way because the engineers also uh, get basic knowledge of engineering could help them to get familiar with the technologies and other things. Also, the disadvantage is a much longer the training time. Uh, he's a graduate of MIT, PhD. Then he did his MD in Miami. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to have him. He's an expert in medical imaging as well. Also. Thank you.
I think it's important to start with a vision and to state why we're all here, what this is all about, and why we do what we do. And the medical vision for tomorrow is graphically uh, illustrated there. Uh, it really boils down to two words, health and longevity. Uh, the overall goal of the whole medical field is to make us uh, healthy, to keep us healthy, to maintain health for as long as we live. With the concept being shown there, be born healthy, live a long life without acquiring illness. And when the end of life comes, for this to transition with no suffering from disease, who would sign up for that? Basically, to die healthy. Be born healthy to die healthy. That's, that's the goal. Achieving this goal requires technological innovation. We need the kinds of technologies that Michaelis described and others in order to facilitate precision diagnostics at an early enough stage to intervene when things go wrong so that you can prevent them from progressing. And appropriate therapeutics uh, as well with the preventive strategies when they uh, are appropriate to even uh, stop disease from happening when and where we can. So this concept of healthy longevity has now been embraced by the U.S. National Institute, uh, U.S. National Academy of Medicine, excuse me. In partnership with 35 countries, this fall, the National Academy of Medicine of the, of the United States will announce a grand challenge with a series of prizes worth millions of dollars The researchers who develop approaches, techniques, technologies, paradigms, uh, fundamental understanding, etc., to help achieve this goal of being healthy throughout the entire of our lives. This grand challenge is called healthy longevity. And as I mentioned before, to emphasize, though started by the National Academy of Medicine in the U.S., the President, Victor Zao, has been very active in pursuing uh, collaboration from across the globe, and indeed 35 countries have signed up to participate in this. So I mentioned the critical role that tech, technological innovation plays. And none other than the renowned molecular biologist, immediate past president of Princeton University, Shirley Tillman, who I happened to have dinner with just a few days ago, made this statement uh, in 2003 when they were celebrating the, the 50th anniversary of the elucidation of DNA structure. At that event, uh, Shirley Tillman observed that as much as new ideas are fundamental to the advancement of science, technological innovation is the engine of scientific progress. So again, technological innovation is the engine of scientific progress. Those of us who are engineers and in biomedical uh, um, technology fields appreciate this. Just four years ago, um, I, with several of my colleagues you see there, Su Chin, uh, Robert Nero, many of you no doubt know, I consider to be, them to be among the fathers of the field of biomedical uh, engineering, both of them well into their 80s. Uh, Su Chin, I think, is about 85 or so. Europe is not far behind. And Rashid Bashir is the, ne the new dean of the College of Engineering at University of Illinois and vice dean of Carl Illinois Medical School. So in 2015, we wrote this perspective piece 
titled Engineering is a New Frontier for Translational Medicine. And in that is this phrase at the bottom that I'm particularly fond of, that we posit that the integration of engineering into medicine and medicine into engineering until boundaries vanish, that's the key thing, until the boundaries vanish, the merging of these two fields, engineering and medicine, until boundaries vanish, will play a critical role in achieving the goals that we had laid out, uh, which actually now I could say would boil down to healthy longevity. To pursue this on the educational front, as Menton indicated, I left the NIH after 15 years to head a new medical school initiative called InMed for Engineering Medicine. This is a unique undertaking of a four-year program produces students who earn both the MD and Masters of Engineering simultaneously. The intent is to create a new kind of invention-minded, problem-solving-minded doctor who we now describe as a physician near, uh, and to anchor this particular goal we will require all of the students in becoming physicianeers to actually invent something to improve health or health care as a requirement of graduation over the four year uh, period, earning again the MD and Masters of Engineering in those four years. This uh, new educational program to really give uh, teeth to this concept of bringing these two fields together starting at the educational level has uh, garnered uh, national attention. Here I am uh, having been interviewed by Proto Magazine which is for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is Harvard's Lee Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, publishes quarterly this magazine, Proto, as in prototype, uh, that focuses on the frontiers of medicine. And in that article, uh, I'm being interviewed specifically about InMed. Here is a building that is being renovated uh, now. Metin, you asked me about this, that's the uh, old bank building right in the middle of the Texas Medical Center. That will be the physical location for the medical school in Med. And we just welcomed our first class of 26 students two weeks ago. There's one of them right there who asked to have a few days off so he could go and propose to his fiance in Canada. And that's Ramez Barsoom there down on one knee uh, proposing in this very scenic location uh, to his fiance. This just recently happened. Uh, but just to let you know that these students, uh, though while uh, bright with very high GPAs and grade point averages and MCAT scores, are also regular people, as you can see here with <clears throat> so, what I'd like to do for the remainder of uh, my presentation is to really uh, further elucidate with some examples of the value of technological innovation and how this can and is beginning to transform uh, healthcare. Uh, this approach I will take by describing this in three uh, broad areas, and those three listed here. With these kinds of innovations, we're able to make new discoveries about disease, turn those discoveries into health, and in so doing, uh, this catalyzes solving future uh, problems and making future advances. 
First, looking at the fundamental knowledge about disease. Now, this is one of the things that I included specifically for Julia and Ashley, uh, because probably some of you may have seen this before. But this uh, next slide that I'm going to show is an audiovisual slide. Uh, it illustrates something that if you haven't seen it before, and the first time I saw this, was a surprise to me. It shows how moved, something like a person's mood, which you think is all controlled up here by your will and things like that, is really mediated by more physics and physical principles, the, the flow of electrons. In this case, you'll see a person in the operating room who has chronic depression, um, refractory to conventional treatment, now being pursued for deep brain stimulation as a form of treatment for refractory depression. And in the video, I want you to do two things. At the top of the video, we'll show the amount of voltage that's being applied in a specific location in the brain that's uh, being trying to identify by trial and error. And as the voltage is being modulated, and it will show it on the graphic, also observe the change in the facial expressions of the patient and how the patient grades her mood level herself on a scale of 1 to 10. So the up here at the top will be the voltage level being applied. Now again, keep in mind that she uh, has been chronically depressed and by her own admission has not smiled in years. tracks in the brain, uh, 
uh, demonstrates that the sweet spot is the intersection of these three major bundles that you see there in yellow, red, and blue. The green spot here is where uh, they, they intersect. So this is a point where these three bundles come together <coughs> is the point which can be variable from person to person that needs to be stimulated. So this report saying defining critical white matter pathways is what mediates successful deep brain stimulation for treatment resistant depression. So that is where it needs to go. Uh, we now have the ability with high resolution diffusion tensor imaging to see the pathways in the brain, these crossing fibers as you see there, and identify on a patient by patient basis exactly where that critical intersection <coughs> point is. The person who invented uh, diffusion tensor imaging, DTI is shown there, it's Peter Basson. And in the previous uh, image that you saw, the colors were simply to map direction. So one color was front back, another color was left right, the other color was top down. In this case, Peter has now developed an approach where he can use diffusion tensor imaging to measure the diameter of the neuronal tracts. And from that, actually calculate the conduction velocity. So in this image, is the color actually corresponds to neural conduction latency. This is a new parameter. This hasn't been done before, where you actually in humans are, are able to not only image the tracks, but identify the rate of conduction along them. So in a normal person, presumptively normal, here are the relative speeds you can see. Blue is uh, normal speed, and this is latency, and then red, the darker it is, or the redder it is, uh, the slower it is, the more latent uh, it is. With this kind of map, and now being able to do this in patients, we have a parameter you could follow. So with patients with schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, um, anxiety, for example, you could see these uh, variances. And when you apply medications, you could determine whether or not it pushes it towards uh, the norm and the norm. That was proposed by Peter just this year at the uh, annual MR meeting. <coughs> he showed this data here where we've done an early validation of neural conduction velocity in the peripheral nerve where you actually can measure the uh, average conduction velocity in red, and with that, correlate and compare the diffusion tensor MR derived um, diameters of, and from those diameters uh, determine the conduction speed. And you can see here, although a small number of patients being done, uh, a reasonable experimental correlation between those two, uh, validating this pot the potential for, uh, for imaging the propagation of speed along pathways. Something that we didn't have before, and the opportunity to learn something new about the brain and health and disease that we couldn't do before. As a result of technological innovation. These kind of studies have also produced new insights into the wiring of the brain and actually the discovery that each of us has a unique uh, connection pathway called a connectome. In fact, the connectome for each of us is so unique that it has been likened to uh, a fingerprint. And researchers at Yale have demonstrated that once you get a person in, establish his or her connectome, they could go away, come back, and with 96% accuracy, identify a person based on his brain, a human connectome. The connectome not only is unique, but it appears to correlate with various behavioral features, such as fluid intelligence. So what is fluid intelligence? 
It's the capacity for on-the-spot reasoning, not dependent on a storehouse of knowledge, but the ability to solve problems. Uh, this is uh, evaluated with a test, and the test gives you this food intelligence uh, metric factor, and here you see the predicted uh, performance on those tests versus the observed performance on the test for quite a number of individuals, and a rather remarkable correlation between, between what you would predict would be somebody's functionality and what turns out to be. Even uh, research now suggests that the human connectome, the brain connectome, on an individual basis correlates with other behavioral features such as extroversion and neuroticism. So again, I think this gives us a tool that we could utilize to begin to evaluate the effectiveness of various therapies and pharmaceutical interventions. Something that we didn't have before. Now, uh, those are things that we're discovering anew. Some examples of how this uh, innovation is beginning to impact on health in a, in a practical way. Uh, here is a patient who has been imaged with an MR technique uh, that is particularly advanced in that it does four-dimensional imaging with high resolution in all four dimensions, spatial and temporal. And he used a variety of techniques there that you see in blue. Compressed sense and parallel imaging view sharing and so forth. Those are all different approaches that can be used to speed up MR acquisition in space and in time. And with this, the image on the left you see is a patient with a uh, breast cancer. The tumor <coughs> is very bright. Uh, the brightness is consequent the contrast agent gadolinium is given. It shows a feeding artery. The arterioles are shown. And here is the time intensity curve of that lesion, that tumor, before in blue and after in red, uh, chemotherapy. The rapid uptake of this uh, contrast agent, uh, shown with this high resolution uh, in, in, in uh, time, image, and space, shows that this is a highly vascular lesion. So despite it being uh, what's referred to as triple negative, that is for the three genes that are known to modulate uh, breast cancer for which therapies exist, in this case the patient is negative for all of those three, so not a candidate for those kinds of uh, genetic therapies. Uh, this usually carries a bad diagnosis, but in this patient, it is so vascular uh, that there is substantial, actually rather remarkable response, you can see, that the tumor is not visualized after chemotherapy. This becomes a candidate who, a patient who is a candidate for breast sparing surgery. So one of the things that's happening now is beginning to use virtual and augmented reality, or mixed reality as individuals are calling, are calling us. This is being done at Stanford for you too. Brian Hargreaves and Bruce Daniels, if you want to check them out. So what is being shown here is the person with the hollow lens is able to see an MR image and superimpose that on the chest of the patient who is laying there. This is a mannequin, but you're demonstrating in principle what one could do. This then allows you to effectively see beneath the skin. So you have the patient there. No cutting has been done yet, but you see exactly where the tumor is. In this case, it's shown in green. Here is the green tumor. And so the surgeon knows exactly where to, to uh, uh, cut, where to insert the scalpel and what needs to be removed and maximize the sparing of breast tissue through this kind of approach. Uh, here is uh, a video that actually shows a patient. This dark circle here in black 
is what <clears throat> the physician thought the uh, location of the tumor was uh, based on all of the imaging that was done, then uh, the hollow lens is, is, is uh, placed on, you can see the superimposed mesh, and then this, this uh, fluorescent area there is shown where the lesion is being felt uh, by the surgeon, and then the green is what the rendering is from the superimposition of the MR image. And you can see those two uh, correspond much more closely than does the actual uh, palpated lesion and what the uh, medical physician thought it, where, it thought, where he thought it was located, or she thought it was located, by this circle here. So here is where it actually is, and here is where the MR holographic uh, image suggest that it is. Still being validated, uh, but you can see the potential there for more precise surgery. Here's a new technique uh, that was introduced now, actually it's not that new, about 15 or so years ago called MR elastography, which basically has replaced as a non-invasive tool the invasive uh, approach to biopsying the liver. So MRE after 3,000 patients with liver biopsies has been correlated and demonstrated to be as accurate in identifying liver fibrosis with this non-invasive approach uh, as is the invasive and much more expensive uh, needle biopsy of the liver. So that is now well established. The question being asked here is, is can it also be applied to the preoperative evaluation of, of the brain. Uh, and you will recall, those of you who are familiar with this, that is, this is done by actually pulsing an organ with the ultrasonic waves here that causes the vibration of all of the tissue and a response of the tissue to this gentle wave, its movement, is actually observed and measured by MR. So there is the uh, MRI. There is the pillow that does the driver. Uh, here is the low resolution image of the brain. Here is the wave that's propagating through the brain tissue uh, as a result of the uh, ultrasonic driver. And then one can invert this wave image to actually extract the stiffness of the tissue uh, based on how that wave moves through it. And that's the, called the elastogram. What's being proposed here is this be, being used, or actually not proposed, is actually being used now, to evaluate the suitability of pituitary uh, tumors for removal from a minimally invasive surgical approach where you go in through the nostril, as you can see here, and you don't have to do a craniotomy. Uh, because you're using these small instruments, it's critical that the tumor be soft and pliable so that you can sort of extract it. If it was very dense, and certainly if it was calcified, this wouldn't work. You'd have to close uh, and bring the patient back for a second operation, actually open the skull and do it as an open procedure. So here is the, in this particular uh, patient, here is the image, here is the shear stiffness quantified by MR elastography in kilopascals. So this is a quantification of how stiff it is. Uh, you can see here down in this area, it is not as stiff as much of the remainder of the brain. So this is a more pliable uh, tumor. Uh, unlike this particular patient, who has a much more uh, dense tumor, and this patient would not be suitable for this minimally invasive approach. <coughs> uh, we all are aware of the advent of machine learning and deep learning, artificial intelligence, and what this shows is this uh, neural net based 
development of an inversion approach from going from the wave image to the elastogram by direct inversion. So here's the wave image that's being shown in three different uh, uh, patients where they have lesions that are um, just mildly stiff to, to uh, more uh, substantially stiff. There, here is the uh, conventional elastogram, and here is the appearance when it's done with a neural-based network by way of machine learning. So the, to illustrate the improvement here, you see this phantom with these inclusions of di various degrees of stiffness in the phantom. Here is the uh, direct inversion uh, elastogram image using the conventional approach, and here is the approach using the artificial, intel artificial intelligence approach using a neural net in inversion. So very promising for improving this uh, substantially. Uh, this was simply to show this beginning to be used in neurodegenerative disease where patients with different types of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, a normal control, uh, frontotemporal dementia here with various uh, patterns, also uh, similarly to different degrees of stiffness uh, that can be quantified with this approach. Now, uh, one of the interesting, I think, breakthroughs in the last five years uh, in our field has been uh, the demonstration that electrical neuromodulation of the spine uh, can have an effect in partially reversing paralysis even after it has existed for years, chronic paralysis. This was pioneered by Reggie Edgerton and his colleagues at UCLA. Uh, when they had this really breakthrough uh, demonstration with four quadriplegics. Uh, that was in April of, uh, of, of 2014. Progressing now, uh, showing here this young student who was a student in the chiropractic school, she was with her classmates at a pool party, dove into the pool, hit her head, broke her neck, and became paralyzed uh, from the waist down with minimal movement of her hands. These are her parents, her father, her mother. This is Reggie Edgerton, uh, the engineer, and Ron Turco, who devised this neurostimulation approach. And this is the second day of her treatment. I just happened to be in town at that time and was able to observe this. The electrodes are being applied to this patient on the skin and not being surgically implanted as they were in the original story, in, in the original studies with the four patients I mentioned. But you can see that uh, the patient who had difficult sta difficulty standing on her own is now able to stand and move from side to side. That's what's happening. And by moving from side to side with the stimulation, um, she demonstrated sort of some new functionality after the second day of this neuromodulation treatment. Her father, who was here, just exploded in happiness when he saw his daughter start to do this. Which, and, you know, he said, she couldn't do that before. And, you know, and he like almost started crying, actually. He was so overjoyed. Uh, tremendous promise. Uh, initially done at UCLA and then ported out to the University of Kentucky and then reproduced now in Mayo Clinic. You can see in 2017 this headline here, a man who has paralyzed legs using a device to stimulate spinal cord. In this case, these electrodes, 16 electrodes were surgically implanted. He underwent a series of stimulation patterns, not sufficient to cause muscle contraction to elicit, elicit an action potential, but enough to change the set point, it appears, at which the neurons in the spinal cord respond to signals coming from the central nervous, from the brain. Uh, Menton, here is uh, a, a patient who's from Texas. Just a month ago, experimental spinal cord treatment helps Texas man regain some motor 
some function after paralyzing exited. Again, quite remarkable. Here's a video of one of the original four patients you see there on the left. The electrodes are for monitoring muscle contraction. They are not stimulating, so he has no stimulation happening at this point. It's just after he's been trained and, and had neuromodulation. Keep in mind, he was completely motor, had motor paralysis before that. And this other individual, similarly, uh, uh, complete motor paralysis, now able to stand independently and throw the ball against the wall, steady himself enough that he can throw the ball against the wall and play and catch. Uh, nothing short of remarkable for the patients in whom this has been, been uh, executed. Not widespread yet because it's quite intensive, a study, labor intensive, expensive to do, and still being done in a way to try and understand uh, for whom this is a viable therapeutic approach and who it works in and who it doesn't. What we uh, need uh, to be more helpful is uh, imaging of the pathways in the spinal column as being demonstrated here by the group at Mass General Hospital and Martino Center, uh, so that you can observe what happens with this neuromodulation, neurostimulatory uh, uh, approach and studies. Um, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so that I have, um, just a few words about things that are on the horizon. So I mentioned machine learning, and of course the whole world has been overtaken by, by this. Uh, last year, the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine had not one but two workshops on machine learning in the same year. It was so uh, such a hot topic. So this was the first one. And the uh, winner of the first place paper also from Stanford, is a Kai Addy. He's a tall guy under the red arrow that you see there, who uh, had a paper that talked about uh, autonomously executing a complete MR examination of the heart from prescription to ejection fraction in under three minutes. So that's amazing. For those of us who have done MR imaging uh, and for the heart, uh, as I have for, for, for many years, you never complete a study in three minutes. It'll take you 15 minutes just to set it up, uh, another 15 minutes or so to acquire the image, and then some additional time to actually analyze it. But here is what was happening automatically. The scans were being done, uh, planes were being identified uh, with these machine learning algorithms. Uh, and a series of orthogonal slices relative to the axis of the heart, you can see, were being acquired uh, uh, totally automatically. And then after those, uh, the images being uh, traced out with the machine learning uh, algorithm to trace out the right ventricle you can see in the red, uh, the endocardium in yellow, and the epicardium in green. And from that, uh, calculated ejection fraction. Before machine learning algorithms existed, uh, approaches that automatically could analyze these cardiac images, even though they were beautiful, didn't exist. Uh, and I can speak from that as one who uh, tried and had a graduate student working on such a thing. Here is uh, another uh, illustration of the impact of four-dimensional imaging with the machine learning to do motion tracking and tracking over, uh, over all four uh, directions, such that you're able to image irregular motion despite it being irregular, unusual for, for MR, which is very motion sensitive, it's blurred out if you don't gate it, but the ability to now image these twins in their twin placenta, you can actually see uh, the uh, placenta between them and their uh, regular, irregular, and involuntary motions uh, being observed. Quite remarkable. It's remarkable to be able to see this. And it actually goes beyond that. 
the search fidelity with the images that one can begin to do functional uh, neural imaging of the brain of those subjects. Also with machine learning here, uh, Dengang Shen at UNC, uh, University of North Carolina, uh, did this uh, study and demonstration where he took the best image of a brain that you could obtain, which is with the 7T magnet, and determined the relationship between that image and the signals that you actually get, not with the 7T magnet, but with the 3T magnet that costs half as much. And from that established relationship, uh, train an algorithm to generate that kind of 7T image from 3T data. And that's being shown here. So on the left is the actual 3T image obtained with 3T data. Here is the simulated 7T-like image based on this machine learning algorithm, but using data from the 3T scanner. And it looks very much like the actual 7T image. The blue box shows the expanded regions, and you can see the similarity between those expanded regions, magnified regions, with this approach. Again, just sort of demonstrating the same. This is a 7T-like image, looks like the 7T image, but generated from data obtained with the 3T scanner. High-resolution imaging with less expensive equipment. Uh, for the students, and similar uh, to the sum of work that Michaelis, uh, Mike was showing, uh, here, uh, when I was at the NIH, a year before I left, we had a competition nationwide for undergraduate students. The winning team was from, this was a prize, uh, by the way, we gave first, second, third place prizes. The winning team was from the University of Maryland, who uh, used this helmet that they developed that measured EEG signals. From those signals, uh, learn those signal patterns in patients with Alzheimer's, and then demonstrated that they could uh, use this to identify Alzheimer's in patients based on the EEG uh, patterns obtained with this uh, particular. <coughs> Alzheimer's diagnosis today is primarily conducted by neuroimaging imaging techniques such as MRI and PET, uh, as well as quality of cognitive assessment such as the MMSC. These procedures are lengthy, expensive, and complicated explaining why it may take up to two years for patients to get the care that they need. Synaptic Engineering has developed a device combining open source, open BCA hardware with machine learning models to attack this problem head on. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, costing the nation close to $259 billion annually. Okay, so because of time, I'll stop that, but you can see that was an undergraduate student, looked like you. So this kind of work being done by undergraduate students. Uh, my last uh, two closing slides really talk about uh, work in the molecular medicine arena. Uh, here's a device uh, developed at MGH that bas basically converts a cell phone into a uh, device that's actually able to detect cancer at the cell and molecular level. It uses this clip-on that you see here that has a light that illuminates the stage. Uh, on the stage is placed a blood sample after it has been mixed with, this, with these beads that are labeled uh, with antibodies. And the antibodies against <clears throat> the proteins that are expressed uh, by genes that are biomarkers for a specific uh, cancer and cancer type. In this case, breast cancer, where the HER2 EPCAM and EGFR genes are being uh, assayed. Uh, when those are present, those are fixed to the cell. The blood is then illuminated with uh, the light. Uh, the cells that have these immunolabeled beads at attached to them cause a diffraction pattern. The fraction uh, pattern is then imaged with the cell phone sent to the cloud. 
The cloud has a reconstruction algorithm. The reconstruction algorithm then reconstructs the actual cells with the beads on them, one by one. You can actually uh, calculate. Uh, this isn't working. Uh, but you can calculate the number of cells that are present. This should, should be animated. And then the number of cells can be counted, the number of normal, total number of cells, number of normal cells, and number of cells with beads on them. And here is an example of the reconstructed images that you see here. This one shows that a cell has many uh, uh, beads on it, so that, and these beads target her too. Uh, so that this patient has uh, cancer that uh, actively expresses HER2, moderately expresses F FCAM, and does not express EGFR. So it can characterize uh, at the molecular level using the cell phone cloud-based machine learning algorithm to identify the tumor type and characterize its biomarkers. Uh, here's an approach that is in the immunoengineering arena, uh, in which, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the researchers, again, uh, this is a group uh, from, from Harvard that uh, published this Kim et al. in Nature Biotech, where they inject a self-assembling uh, construct of mesoporosilical nanorods that contain recruiting factors that attract dendritic cells, and also an antigen uh, of a specific tumor, where the idea is to develop a cancer vaccine. The dendritic cells then present this uh, antigen in such a way that it uh, causes the uh, immune system to be stimulated, uh, produce a large number of killer T cells that is being shown here. Uh, and thereby uh, have a response that is prepared to attack uh, this expression of uh, this kind of tumor. They demonstrated uh, in mice that when vaccinated with this approach and then challenged with the, the specific tumor that uh, this vaccine was developed against, uh, that the tumor did not develop in those mice. Here, they're going a step further. And so just last year, reporting uh, two different versions of this particular construct uh, in mice that, that had not only primary tumors, but metastatic tumors. And the growth of the tumor in the control mouse is shown here. The course of the tumor after being injected with this vaccine is shown here, that the tumor grew for a while and then regressed with the initial version of the vaccine and with the more augmented version of the vaccine, it uses a chemical that increases the absorption. This is a VP. So that the uh, bottom line here is that they had complete tumor regression consequent to the injection of this particular vaccine. So not only preventative, but also therapeutic. And the survival curves for the mice are shown here after the administration of the vaccine as you, uh, as I just described, with uh, remarkable survival uh, in the mice that died in a small number of days, have now surviving out to 300 days, a high percentage of them, with this particular uh, tumor vaccine. So with that, I'll close with uh, one of my famous a favorite, it's not, not famous for me, but it is famous, let's say a favorite, uh, favorite quotes from the German uh, philosopher Max Weber. And I would particularly uh, admonish uh, the young people in the audience to take this to heart, that history has taught us that striving for the impossible is a necessary precondition for achieving the possible. Thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments? Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Uh, for the inspiring, for the inspiring presentation, and uh, indeed you gave uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know different aspects, different uh, areas of expertise coming together. Uh, you mentioned about the collaboration between medicine and uh, engineering, but it's not only that. A lot of mathematics, a lot of physics, a lot of biology is involved. All that in a single uh, operating room in order to achieve uh, the, the, the healthy longevity that yes. uh, you mentioned. Uh, but uh, uh, I am amazed though about the uh, importance that you gave to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, let's say, uh, besides the comment, I would like to ask about your opinion. Because uh, machine learning needs a lot of uh, information, a lot of data. Uh, already talking about uh, the, the uh, neuro uh, uh, activity, the, the molecular biology activity, all this brings uh, uh, a lot of information, a lot of data. But also, in order to achieve generality, the machine learning algorithm needs a lot of difference. Uh, uh, data from different centers. Do you think that time has come that uh, the uh, centers, the medical centers, have realized the importance of uh, the data uh, and uh, the importance of uh, uh, combining information in, uh, let's say, in the same uh, acquisition <laughs> protocol in order to facilitate this uh, success of uh, the artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, thank you. Great, great comments and a great question. Uh, let me first agree with you, with your first comment, about uh, the convergence, is what you described, of all of the sciences, uh, the physical sciences, the life sciences and engineering, they're all integrated. And though I emphasize engineering and medicine, in my mind, I'm talking about everything, all, all of it. Um, as many of us know, the terminology that's been popularized now to describe that is convergence, and that's what that refers to. Uh, and I, I would even add the behavioral sciences. So the quantitative sciences, physical sciences, life sciences, engineering, and behavioral sciences, all integrated. And they're all a part of life. They're all a part of nature. Uh, and they're all involved and will be involved in problem solving. Um, the um, comments about artificial intelligence I think largely reflects the massive amount of attention that's being paid to this now uh, across the globe. Uh, you can't go to a scientific meeting these days without artificial intelligence being front and center. The last two meetings I went to, uh, one was cardiovascular, the other one was an MR, MRI, those two. Uh, and, I, and I've heard similarly at other meetings that uh, more, uh, more uh, medically directed meetings that AI is, is uh, a, a dominant feature of, of all of them. Um, the uh, second point that you made in that regard is the need to have data available from which to learn. So the learning is not magical. It's, there's no magic in the computer that it is imbued with. But it is able to do uh, a massive number of calculations and correlations, which is where this so-called intelligence comes from. It's just correlating a lot of data. And in order to develop this artificial intelligence, you're quite right. We do need to have these data sets across disciplines and across anatomic scales, you know, from 
molecules to cells to organs uh, to hold humans. Um, and the more that that's available, from the molecular level to the whole or, or organ level, uh, the more likely we are to make these kinds of discoveries contained within that data that the human eye really can't discern in, in a sort of in terms of imaging, or that we as, as humans can discern, but after a whole lot of experience. So um, in the imaging field, we describe the future as being one uh, not in which uh, artificial intelligence takes over, but that there will be sort of two kinds of physicians. Uh, physicians who work and use artificial intelligence as an aid, and those who don't work. Okay. Any other questions? One of the points that Robert made is to share the data. Oh, sharing, yes. Um, thank you, Minton. Uh, so you remember a few years ago, there was uh, maybe in the U.S., uh, when uh, the last year that Obama was president, uh, Joe Biden, whose uh, son, uh, died from a glioblastoma multiforme, a very lethal type of brain tumor. And they started what was called uh, this Cancer Moonshot Initiative. His uh, whole goal and his plea then to the scientific community was to do just that, to share data. There's a gigantic amount of data across the globe. Uh, and the sharing it could facilitate accelerated understanding, learning, and improvement. So, yes, I agree with, with that point. The NIH, by the way, now is really pushing that as well. You know, the, sure. In fact, the plan, the NIH plan is to have all of the data generated by grants that it provides be made publicly available. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you introduce yourself? Your institution affiliation is up. Oh, uh, hello, I am Marina. I am an undergraduate student. Can you hear me? Oh, quite well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. She says she's a graduate student. I'm an undergraduate student. Oh, undergraduate. I'm sorry. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. Everything you said was incredibly inspiring for us and very uh, interesting. And I would like to ask you in regard to the first, uh, the depression treatment that you showed us. I noticed that we were applying voltage to the person's brain. And I was wondering how can this be a treatment? It wasn't uh, to detect cancer. It was meant to detect cancer, depression. It was meant to treat it, right? Yes. And, but how can we treat it? Is, uh, what's the general idea? Because I guess we cannot simply continuously, continuously applying voltage on the brain and expect to... Okay. So, uh, uh, thank you uh, for your question. And are you a student? Uh, what is your major field? I am here at the, the Electrochemical Engineering and Computer Science. Okay. So there is a technique now that is established called deep brain stimulation that uses electrodes in sort of a pacemaker uh, where the electrodes are surgically implanted into the brain. It's a treatment for Parkinson's disease. Uh, the electrodes are placed in the brain, they come out, and then they're connected to uh, a battery powered sort of pacemaker. And that provides uh, a stimulation. So to, constant to, stimulation. Pardon? So you mean constant stimulation? Yes. Through the entire life of a patient? For as long as a battery lasts. And, uh -huh. and you change it. <laughs> yeah, sort of like a pacemaker. Okay. You think of it as a pacemaker for the brain. I see, okay. Thank you. And because of the 
success with uh, treating Parkinson's disease, uh, one of the neuroscientists uh, experimented with it for treating depression. Hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Harisis. I'm also an undergraduate student. Uh, I'd also like to thank you about your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is on the on a similar subject. Uh, when you mentioned anxiety and depression, uh, you meant them as uh, you were referring to the pathological conditions, not a temporary state of uh, yes psychology. Okay, yes. that was just a clarification. No. I needed. Yes, we all get anxiety. You know, I, I get anxiety every time I'm going to give a talk. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, but no, you know, anxiety as a, um, as you describe, a pathological condition for some people is severe if you talk to them. And they even know that they have anxiety. They know that's unrealistic. And they just, you know, think that everybody is, in, um, in some cases, may think that people are talking about them and they aren't, and they know they aren't, and then they feel real anxious about it. Or walking down a pathway, you're just concerned that something is going to happen and fall on you, and it isn't. Uh, you know, the, the, for those who have anxiety, it's quite a problem. I had a colleague who, for years, was quite uh, normal, and then his wife, to whom he'd been married for about 35, maybe 40 years, died. They had known each other since high school. And after that, he became very, very anxious. Uh, we used to go to baseball games uh, together, and he couldn't really bear to sort of sit at a baseball game. And even, it, just, it was hard to explain and sort of understand, but it was a very real condition. He just he thought that at any minute something bad was going to happen. Thank you. Yes. I have a quick question as number two. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned a very important point. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm Matthew City from Flax Plan Institute. Um, you mentioned a very important point that all these technologies that we know of or we will develop. Uh, and how the doctors respond to that. So sometimes doctors think that they will be replaced by these technologies one day. So I, I'm curious about your experience and, and the perspective on can we train new doctors, future doctors, that don't take this as a kind of a, a kind of threat, but more helping them for assisting them for, to, to make life much better for their, their you know, practice. Well, I'm afraid that human nature is human nature. Uh, one would hope that, perhaps you're, you're right, one would hope you could do that. So perhaps in a part of medical training, we teach the doctors to learn that change is constant and to not get frozen into practicing medicine at the state and at the level at which they learned it, because it will certainly improve in the years to come. I have also been amazed with uh, some of the colleagues that I have when new technologies come along and they don't want to learn them. They get comfortable with the old way and don't want to learn the new way. And I think that's what I was referring to with human nature. But maybe we can start educating the physicians to expect that learning is a lifelong process. And it doesn't stop when you finish medical school or you get your master's or you get your PhD. You, you know, so I, I have a son that's the age of some of you. And I tell him when he's taking tests, I tell him I'm studying for a test effectively because I, mean, I have to give this presentation. I'm going to get questions. and. And I'm going to get examined, and I also I get evaluated, and you just never stop having tests. Sorry, guys, but 
the truth is, throughout life, you never stop having tests. You always have tests of some sort. Can I ask you a question? Half an hour ago, there were six of us. It doesn't matter how many papers you publish in biomedical journals, your age index. There was only one medical doctor. We appreciate his effort. He was able to approach the head and help him more than any of us. So I think nobody can replace the medical doctor. We would like to appreciate your effort. Okay.